Just get everything shuffled into place. And... Can everybody see that then? We can. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, had a bit of tech issues earlier on, but uh, Gary sorted me out. Good on him. Um, right, yeah, well, I'm going to talk to you about Westerns, and there will be a little bit of otherness in this as well, so uh, it might suit. Um, you know, why is this man talking to us about Westerns as well as folk horror? Well, it's just the kind of thing he does. Um, right, yeah, I won't hang around. Um, the focus of this paper is uh, to establish a bit of a correlation, primarily between British folk horror and the concept of the frontier uh, as found within the Western genre. Uh, it's probably important to say as well, whilst there will be no argument that any given folk horror text is to be understood as a Western, uh, it will evidence folk horror as using the concept of the frontier uh, in a very similar manner to the Western. Um, yeah, folk horror's use of the more complex and or disjointed aspects of frontier mythology, uh, using them as an expression of a crisis of public myth, which we can take as extending into the 21st century many crises of public myth. Um, the initial definitions of the frontier, I'll just skip a slide, there go, uh, are to be understood in relation to Richard Slotkin. Uh, he regarded them as uh, the frontier mythology as the myth of confrontation between civilization and savagery, the deconstruction of savagery and regeneration through experience of violence in the war against savagery. This also relates to Friedrich Jackson Turner's definition as it is a place at the hither edge of the free land, uh, something thankfully simplified by John Coelty in 1999. Uh, in terms of popular fiction, he described the frontier as a mythologized meeting point between savagery and civilization. Civilization as law and order, and savagery as represented by Indians or lawless outlaws. Uh, as Slotkin states, the European colonists' initial view of the new world, the frontier, was that of an Eden from which the serpent and forbidden trees had been thoughtfully excluded. Um, an Arcadian image of order and symmetry, uh, a garden with walls removed, uh, they quickly realised this wasn't a true representation of the frontier. It was, in fact, um, wild and chaotic. Slotkin regards the transfiguration of early settlers between chaos and the kindred intelligence of the Native Americans as creating a conflict between pre-existing cultural values and mythologies uh, and this was the starting point for frontier mythology. Uh, it's the issues posed by this transfiguration, the blurring of boundaries. This also clearly leads to folk horror's own use of frontier mythology. An easy starting point for this uh, is perhaps Witchfinder General in 1968. Ian Cooper's 2011 study, he regards the film's representation of history and landscape as used uh, in such a way to consciously evoke the Western genre. Uh, the film's lead, Ian Ogilvie, there's a picture of him just there with a pistol, uh, is quoted as recalling director Michael Reeves as stating his vision for the production as a Western. Uh, this is a galloping across the countryside in search of the bad guy revenge Western. Uh, the concept of revenge, which is memorably achieved at a brutal physical extreme in the film's final scene, uh, can be interpreted as something aligning itself with savagery. Uh, the desire for revenge is something Cooper regards as being one of the film's familiar Western tropes. Uh, so initially, Witchfinder General gives us a, a simplistic parallel to the Western and the frontier narrative. Um, Cooper makes use of the term frontier justice regarding the film's climax. Uh, the justice meted out in Witchfinder General is comparable to the kind of Old Testament morality uh, which Kim Newman identifies in the Western High Plains Drifter, um, in which a stranger, Clint Eastwood, rides into a remote town enacting sadistic and violent acts upon the townspeople and a gang of outlaws. Uh, the viewer is left to interpret these acts as punishment for revenge by the people of the town's part in the equally sadistic death of their former marshal. In the opening and closing shots of High Plains Drifter, of which we see on the slide there, uh, it is as though the stranger, the one who delivers the justice, appears from out of the wilderness itself. Um, yeah, he's like an agent of the landscape, both geographical and mythological, sent to deliver the justice and enforce its own law. Um, like many of the rituals within folk or narratives, it carries with it a savage and ambiguous moral, dare I say, a logic, in order to maintain a frisson of stability. Um, how his demise in The Wicker Man might spring to mind, but taking this to the 21st century, 
uh, Wakewood, when Aidan Gillen's character questions Timothy Spall's community elder, um, why must a ritual be performed in a certain way? He answers, because that is the way it has always been. It's the law. It's the justice of the frontier, the landscape. This brand of justice um, of the landscape extends to the representation of the frontier's people, uh, a transfigurization with civilization. Um, so this representation, Cooper recalls in uh, Witchfinder General, he describes the peoples in that as blank-faced yokels. Um, Kim Newman you know, often points out in Westerns as well that um, it's typically the, the townspeople are sort of whipped into a frenzy by rabble-rousers in fancy waistcoats. We might align this with the likes of Matthew Hopkins or even Lord Summers Isle. Uh, the portrayal of frontiers people as savage and unsophisticated bears comparison to Edward Said's concept of Orientalism. Uh, the West European world depicting the Orient, the East, as primitive, irrational, violent, fanatic and essentially inferior in order to represent and in turn maintain its own civilised hegemonic superiority. Um, a representational notable has come into prominence in the early 19th century uh, colonist era, a time period when yeah, early European settlers went to the Western frontier. Further parallels, let's have a change of slide. Further parallels uh, regarding the representation of the frontier in film in John Ford's The Searchers, uh, the, Na the Native Americans within it were not mythical, uh, yet Ford allowed for what Newman describes as a deliberate and erroneous portrayal of historical elements uh, within The Searchers uh, Navajos speaking Navajo were playing Comanches. Um, this erroneous representation of Native Americans in the Western Frontier becomes comparable Sorry to interrupt, to George. Yeah. Uh, I think you're sharing the PowerPoint application rather than the slideshow itself. Oh, okay. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, do you want me to stop a minute? Okay, I'll carry on, eh? If, uh, I'll keep the talk going, yeah? I'll keep talking it's, then. It's, it's up to you if if you want to just you know click onto whichever slide you're up to because we, we can see the actual PowerPoint application there. Oh, sorry, yeah. I should be on full screen actually, but yeah, I thought I was on full screen. Um, I'll end show, so I'll go back again. Sorry about that. Can you see it differently now? Uh, yeah, it's it's moved on to slide three. That's interesting. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, where are we? This misrepresentation of people. Um, so throughout examples of folk horror to this day, we see a variety of imaginative, uh, if grotesque, depictions of ancient trials, rituals and customs. Uh, swimming the witch, as seen in Witchfinder General, was, even in the 17th century, a method of trial already outdated and against the rule of law. Uh, Blood and Satan's claw writer, Robert Wynne Simmons, would later recall his script changing uh, in a bid to echo Tygon. Uh, in, in Tygon's bid to echo Witchfinder General, because they regarded the film should be about the death of the old religion, uh, whatever they truly understood that to be. Uh, supposedly ancient rituals, insular cults, stone circles and garlands of flowers from Satan's Claw to Midsummer, um, yeah, often even played for laughs in films like Hot Fuzz, and if we've seen the Mummified Cat episode of the BBC sitcom Grace and Favour. Um, these tropes continue right into 21st century folk horror, um, often with little grounding in historical accuracy. Um, this aligns folk horror with Amanda Jose Pratt's study of the representation of Native American Indians in the Western frontier. Invisible natives, uh, Pratt argues, in order to maintain a myth of conquest. Uh, the triumph of civilization over savagery, uh, the, native, uh, the native has to become all but invisible. The Indian is reduced to a virtual absence in a strategy whereby the part implies the whole. Um, not only can wardrooms, feather bonnets, smoke signals, half arrows in the side of stagecoaches signify Indian, they can also signify Indianness. Uh, we can immediately start to correlate this to kind of use of various tropes within folk horror to signify the folkloric. I use the term I developed, the invisible pagan we start to use. Um, hold on a second though, the myth of conquest, hold on, that's far too finite. Various examples of folk horror feature these kind of inconclusive or ambiguous endings. Um, this starts to align folk horror with the revisionist or post or anti-Westerns occurring around about the late 1960s. Um, this is where Richard Slotkin says a crisis of public myth began to occur. Uh, he aligned this with the increase in changes in society, a rise in professionalism and multiculturalism. Q 
curiously, that late 1960s period is around about the time when folk horror, our unholy trinity, started to appear. Um, so to recall the use of historical distortion, this connects folk horror with the mythopoic, uh, a term I struggle to pronounce. Uh, Schlotkin uses this to describe the meaning by metaphor process in which early Western settlers established their surroundings, this unfamiliar, uncertain frontier. Um, Foucault's ability to make use of invisible pagans to question what Slotkin might deal as a crisis of public myth. Uh, we can understand this as uh, Foucault using a frontier narrative as an ever-evolving platform, uh, which to use mythopoic expression to express socio-political public crisis of myth as we move into the 21st century. Um, Carol Clover, I'll see if this slide works this time. Is that working? Okay. Uh, Carol Clover describes uh, Urbanoia in her discussion of the split between town and country in several modern horror films. Uh, Urbanoia, well, this is a palpable nervousness at having to face directly the rural victims of city comfort. Uh, she describes Urbanoia as a, a city, uh, a si city country fault line, uh, becomes interchangeable with Slotkin's concept of the frontier. Uh, I might align this with the incomer narrative in folk horror. Um, Skip on a slide again. So, yeah, um, this typically involves income and narratives, the transfigurization of civilized people. Uh, Wakewood, 2008-9, uh, The Daisy Chain, 2006, both feature bereaved parents in, for, in search of a fresh start moving to the country. Uh, Puffball, also, if we've seen that one. These income and narratives uh, typically explore the transfiguration and extends into folk horror's use of the frontier platform. Um, one of the issues Richard Slotkin identifies as a problem with transfiguration is the acculturation, the marriage metaphor. Uh, to live within a wild and chaotic frontier land, one must also, to some extent, adapt, acculturate to the ways and become savage. Slotkin refers to this marriage metaphor as something regarded as slightly taboo. Um, typically a captive narrative, have we seen a film like The Searchers with John Ford, uh, a child is taken into captivity of the savages. Um, we might see this expressed in the Daisy Chain. Um, within this, Thomas and Martha, Samantha Morton and Stephen McIntosh there, uh, adopt uh, a neglected, potentially undiagnosed... Oh, that did a funny thing. I'll keep talking. Uh, undiagnosed autistic child, Daisy. Uh, uh, she's the subject of scorn from older neighbours, uh, older neighbour Sean, and in time, the wider community, um, considering her to be dangerous, a fairy changeling. A uh, tin can selling a tree outside Sean's house serve as folkloric superstitious repellent. They are a signifier of the invisible pagan. Likewise, the other things, fairy rings, Halloween ritual. Daisy's identity is one of a mythopoic other through ancient savage belief or as an invisible pagan, um, as a changeling or through modern civilised diagnosis as autistic. Martha herself becomes captive in her preoccupation with Daisy. Uh, she points out such superstitions were once a way of removing those who are a burden on a community. And such beliefs, um, they reflect a difficult part of social heritage, a savage aspect of genuine social, political, and we could extend this into national identity. Uh, so the daisy chain uses Foucault's mythopoic aspects of the invisible pagan um, and its ambiguity uh, to have this urbanoid frontier land whereby we can question various prejudices of 21st century uh, and historical guilts as well can extend this in all sorts of ways. I'll have another go at giving that screen share there. Uh, I don't know why it's not sharing. I'll keep talking, shall I? Right. Um, re aware this getting short for time. We can extend this in films such as um, it's like an upcycling um, using uh, the, the frontier as an upcycling. Um, yeah, so films like The Ritual, that totemic creature we see at the end, we can align that with issues of kind of male identity. Uh, we can look upon it as all sorts of issues of guilt. Um, if we extend this into Wakewood, what I was going to say is um, it's opening a conversation. So we get the shots at the end of the daisy chain and the end of Wakewood. We have the characters looking directly to screen. Uh, and that is almost to open a conversation, unlike the end of John Ford's Searchers, where John Wayne is seen as kind of the door closes and he's banished because he's acculturated savage ways, where the end of both the Daisy Chain and Wakewood, we have cam uh, characters almost looking, breaking the fourth wall of the camera, as if to engage in conversation. So my argument is ultimately, 
folk horror using that frontier narrative, but updating it. It's more like a post-Western, addressing difficult issues, you know, using kind of updating the invisible pagan and the savage to question, you know, are we ready to move this conversation further? However, the way we perhaps aren't moving further and have slightly still inaccurate representations of historical aspects of paganism and ritual, perhaps we're not quite past the full point of crisis of public myth yet. We're still at that point of discussion. Um, and I'll end it there because I'm aware I'm out of time and I do not know what the, uh, the slide share is doing at all. So thank you for that. I uh, hope it made sense.